over to our colleague Ricardo, who will be taking over the press briefing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Baloy. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, my name is Ricardo Masakanya. Uh, we are here uh, for the briefing uh, to release I mean, the report into allegations against uh, Rahima Musa, mother and child hospital, which is based in Gauteng. Uh, as part of the, our uh, rules, uh, I think um, uh, Mr. Baloy has already I mean, alluded to the fact that I mean, uh, let us switch off our cell phones uh, so that we don't disturb I mean, uh, the proceedings. Uh, I would like to welcome you all. We really appreciate your presence, uh, the members of the media, our principals uh, here, uh, and also the colleagues uh, that are also here. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the program, uh, we'll be having uh, opening welcome and purpose of the briefing, which will be uh, done by the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Office of Health Standard Compliance, uh, Dr. Spiom Daweni. And then thereof, uh, we'll have a presentation of the report, uh, which will be uh, done by uh, uh, the Health Ombud, Professor Malhapur Makova. And then from thereof, uh, we'll have uh, remarks uh, by the Minister of Health, uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Uh, Pata. And then from thereof, uh, immediately after that, um, we'll afford I mean, uh, members of the media an opportunity to uh, also ask questions. And also those that uh, have joined us on the uh, visual platforms also will give you I mean, an opportunity also to uh, also ask those questions. Without wasting much time, uh, I'm going to hand over to the CEO, Dr. Mdawedi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Program Director, and good morning to everyone gathered here. I wish to take this opportunity to extend warm greetings and welcome to all guests in attendance. Thank you each and every one of you for joining us this morning in this media briefing that is going to be led by Professor Mali Khapur Makor. I wish to acknowledge and welcome in our midst, the presence of our Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Joe Patla, as well as our Deputy Minister of Health, Dr. Sibongisei Nidlomo. Indeed, I also wish to recognize their leadership in the healthcare sector. In our midst, we also welcome the MEC for Health and Houting, Ms. Nomantun Gomo Ralihoko, accompanied by the HOD, acting HOD in Houting, Mr. Lisiba Malotana, we also have members that will be attending virtually, a member of the Houghton Provincial Legislature, Mr. Jack Bloom, as well as uh, members of the Health Portfolio Committee in Parliament that will be in virtual attendance. Let us also acknowledge and welcome the Deputy Director General of Corporate Services, Ms. Basani Baloyi. We also welcome the Deputy Director General of Public Entities, Governance and Management, mm -hmm in the Department of Health, Dr. Anvan Bilay. We welcome the Deputy Director General of Hospitals, Tertiary Services, and Human Resources in the Department of Health, Dr. Pesi Mathati. Let me also welcome, and indeed it is my pleasure, to acknowledge the presence of our OHSC Board Chairperson, Dr. Ernest Genoshi, as well as an OHSC Board Member, Mr. Rajesh Mahebia. Indeed, a very warm welcome to the health ombud himself, Professor Makoba. Let me also at this stage recognize a team of colleagues, investigators, and senior managers that have worked with the health ombud, Ms. Marita Pomasemola, Ms. Joyce Munyela, Mr. Dla Douglas Mapeto, as led by the executive manager in the office of the health ombud, Dr. Donna Jacobs. <clears throat> if we do not lay ourselves in the service of mankind, then who shall we serve? 
As we serve others in our day-to-day -day activities, every act, every word, every gesture of genuine compassion naturally nourishes our own hearts. We gather once again in a quest to promote learning and a culture of improvement in our health services through the investigation and the resolution of complaints received by the Health Ombuds. The Office of Health Standards Compliance, an independent regulatory entity in the healthcare sector, is tasked with the responsibility as an encompassed in the National Health Act to promote and protect the health and safety of all those that use our health facilities in the country. Similarly, the Health Ombuds, as an independent body, is also tasked to consider, investigate, and dispose lodged complaints without any fear or favor in a fair, expeditious, and economical manner. High-quality health care and safety are regarded as core aspirations of any government and any health care service delivery system. Compliance with the norms and standards regulations through the Office of Health Standard Compliance, as well as the disposal of the investigations and complaints lodged through the Health Ombuds, together should contribute in the provision of quality health care, which then defines the existence of both offices. The purpose of this media briefing is to provide an opportunity and a platform to our Health Ombuds to release the findings of an investigation conducted on allegations against Rahima Musa, Mother and Child Hospital. The complaint came through various channels, through members of parliament, and also was covered widely in the media. Professor Makoba will take us through the report, giving us the details of the investigation that was conducted, the information that was gathered, and the recommendations that were arrived at. We then, as the Office of Health Standard Compliance, have a responsibility to monitor implementation of these recommendations, all aimed at ascertaining that there is improvement in the services that we provide in our health facilities. Let us remember that in the healthcare sector, our patients and all those that visit our health facilities, both in the public and private sector, are our customers. Now, customers don't expect us to be perfect. However, they do expect us to fix things when they go wrong. The commitment of the Office of Health Standard Compliance and the Health Ombud is to promote a just and learning culture that is transparent, open, and accountable when mistakes occur. Therefore, the release of this report should be viewed as an opportunity to develop and improve the provision of health services and should be recognized as a positive way that would contribute towards improving our services. Most importantly, we need to identify the lessons learned and promote accountability. Amidst the challenges that we face in the healthcare sector and that we experience, some of which are known to most of us here, let me acknowledge all the healthcare workers and all the personnel in our health institutions who remain the soldiers who toil through the days and nights in the service to the sick, in the service to the injured, in the service of those that are called to a higher place. Honorable Minister, ladies and gentlemen, allow me and join me kindly as I invite the Health Ombud of South Africa, Professor Malika Brumakoro, Makoba, who actually requires no introduction, who's going to take us through the report. Professor Makoba, it is my honor to invite you to share and release the report, which will then be received by the Office of Health Standard Compliance. Over to you, Prof. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Spiwe. Uh, Ricardo, who is the program director, the Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, the MEC, the Chair of the Board of the OHSC, 
and a board member of the OHSC, Mr. Mahabir, and all of you that are gathered here to come and uh, receive this report, which is by law something that I have to do every time I have prepared a report. Firstly, I have to acknowledge the people who did this work uh, that are called investigators, uh, headed by Dr. Donna Jacobs, uh, the people who really were on the ground, it was Maritabo Masemula and uh, Douglas uh, Mapeto and uh, Joyce Munyela. They were on the field, on, on the ground, to do the hard work. And as it happens in most of these things, uh, the hard workers never appear in front of televisions. Uh, only the people who take the credit like myself do appear. Uh, as you, most of you would realize, yesterday, I think it was the days of the Oscar, uh, obviously uh, actors wait for the Oscars uh, to be shown. And I guess for the health ombud, releasing a report is like uh, coming to the Oscars. It is my Oscar day. It just happens to be a day after the real Oscars. But I was also informed that, uh, like American football, we have to present this uh, uh, report in front of the media and therefore our time is determined by the media rather than by ourselves. We have joined, I think, the, the modern age. I'm going to, to take you through this report uh, like I'm telling a story because when we booked this uh, venue, we thought that we would have a, a place where we could show a movie. And then only on Friday we were told, no, you, you've got a small hall, you can't show any slide. And I even thought maybe I should have booked a, a hall in Marabastad uh, where I can go and show a proper movie and there will be nice sounds, but uh, I wasn't allowed to do that. Be that as it may, um, my team has spent a better part of a year investigating complaints at, uh, at Rahima Musa. And I'm going to, to start this by uh, telling you the conclusions and then work backwards. Uh, remember that uh, at one time in my life, I used to be a doctor. And as doctors, we make diagnosis. And then we c you can sleep, play with your cell phones, but you will have had the message. So what is the conclusion? In 2016, an investigation was taken, uh, was undertaken at Rahima Musa Hospital by Professor Kuvadia and Professor Lombard. They have been working there for a very long time and they are academic at, uh, academics at uh, Rahima Musa. And they came to the conclusion <coughs> in three ways having investigated what was happening at Rahima Musa, that the hospital was unsafe. That, that's the words they used, an unsafe hospital. During our investigations, we interviewed just around 34 people across the hospital, 34 in all. And there were words that became common that we had as we were interviewing these people. Three ways also came up. Dirty, filthy, and unsafe. So those were the words that were used by the people we interviewed. And these are common words that we picked up, I think, as investigators with, with my team. Now, one has to look at this in the background that Rahima Musa, had won the Kanyisa Award some years ago. In fact, I was telling some people that when we were medical students and you wanted to train in one of the best hospitals in the country, you wanted to go to coronation hospitals. Uh, for those that may not know, my mother-in-law actually did her nursing training at uh, Rahima Musa. That must be many years ago, but it tells you the sort of place it used to be. Now, when you hear these words, 
you get worried. So, during the investigation into the allegations against the hospital, the most striking thing has been the fact that this hospital has been neglected over years. Uh, and also, because it's an old hospital, it has uh, a group of people that have worked there for a long time, and for some reason or another, they think they own the hospital. But that's, that's, that normally happens with human beings. You work there for a long you think You think you are the hospital. Uh, most of you remember uh, the late Winnie Mandela. She used to say she's the ANC because she had been in the movement for a long time. But that was just uh, those are just expressions of people. And and some of these people <coughs> obviously have got behaviors that obviously we are making some recomm recommendations about later on. There are two people actually who provided very seminal uh, uh, pieces of evidence. It was Dr. Meyer. I'm sure you heard about him in the media. He actually presented, gave us his uh, his uh, articles that he wrote, uh, that he complained about. And there was uh, a member of Gayton McKenzie party called Mr. Saul, who when he heard about this issue, he went to the hospital and actually did a video so that uh, there is actually visual evidence of what was happening uh, at, at night at uh, Rahima Musa and confirmed almost all the complaints that I'm going to tell you about. So there was evidence that you couldn't dispute. Uh, as, as I said, there was incontrovertible evidence to support some of the allegations that were made by uh, the honorable member. Now, obviously, I know Novandu is here. She is the new MEC and she's trying her best, but she has inherited a mess. And uh, I'm not saying this for the first time, I think she has inherited a mess. And I say this because in my life as an ombud, I did an investigation on life as it remain in 2016. Uh, I did an investigation in Tembisa Hospital in around 2021-2022. Uh, I have now done an investigation in Rahima Musa. Uh, and my, my colleagues in the investigation team have done other investigations in other hospitals. And the pattern that we're seeing is very similar. Now, it becomes significant for the following reasons. Uh, most of you may not realize that I think somewhere in the 90s, the UN identified that health and education were the primary drivers for a vibrant uh, society or democracy and, and a vibrant economy. So you can do many things if you have a population that is uneducated, uh, obviously, it will become unhealthy or it won't understand, I think, the importance of health. And if you have a, a healthy population, it obviously gets to know what to do. And you have a, a, a lively economy and you have a vibrant democracy. So Gauteng, the Gauteng province is the smallest, I think, geographically, but it contributes 33% of the GDP of the country. So. If ever you needed uh, a section or a sector of South African society that needed to function and be up there as an example, the Gauteng province is the province. Uh, you have a concentration of media in Gauteng, concentration of gossipers in Gauteng. You have everything, you know. Uh, uh, the economy is located, the, everybody wants to they leave the Eastern Cape, they leave Limpopo, they all want to be where? In Gauteng. They can even sleep under the bridges here, but when they go home, they tell you, hey, I work in Gauteng. I mean, we all have seen that, we've had cousins doing that. So this province is very important, I think, in the DNA of South Africa, and therefore, I think its functioning and its well-being is very important. That's why I think it's a it's a it's a good example, I think, to to investigate. 
So, what was the complaint that was brought to, to our office? This complaint was lodged on the 6th of April, uh, you know, uh, in 2022. Most of you remember the 6th of April is Van Riebeck's day. Uh, others will remember it as the day on which uh, Solomon Mashangu, I think, was hanged. So it has uh, different meanings, but it's an important date. I don't know why uh, the, the honorable member from the health portfolio brought it on that day. She had three complaints that she brought to the office. That expectant mothers at Rahimo Musa Hospital slept on the floor. The second complaint was that the hospital chief executive officer uh, was not working full time at the hospital to ensure that everything ran smoothly. Since she had been appointed in 2021 January, she had only spent 182 days uh, at that hospital. This complaint was raised by Mr. Jack Bloom of the DA in the legislature and it was confirmed by the previous MEC as uh, being uh, uh, accurate. And that the health, the dignity of, uh, of, of our patients in that hospital was really not been taken care of. As you know, one of the principles of our constitution is dignity and respect. You have to respect people, you have to respect patients, and this was the major complaint so what did we do? Um, as I've already indicated, we s had uh, a group of us going there on, si on site visits. We had personal interviews. We had audio recordings. We had transcriptions that we had to do. We reviewed the literature. We analyzed uh, all the documents that we could find. We took pictures. And I thought I was going to show you a movie of the hospital uh, sh to show you how you know, pipes have broken there, sewage is seeping all over the place, paint is falling apart, but uh, unfortunately, GSCSI decided otherwise that maybe you don't deserve to see that before lunch, uh, maybe for, for other reasons. So as I said, we, between uh, August uh, to November last year, we interviewed uh, 34 people. We, provide, we produced a provisional report um, in December we sent it to all the people that are implicated at, as it's required by law. We asked them to respond uh, and they all responded. Uh, and then we looked at their responses against the evi evidence that we had gathered and uh, we had to then write the final report, uh, taking that into consideration. And all their responses are captured in the report as they are so that we are all transparent, not necessarily naked, but transparent. So that's what we have done. So the report that you are receiving, it's really a, a history of what we did and what we have found. What we did find is that the, most of the responses that we received, I think from uh, all the people that were implicated, actually afforded us the chance to strengthen the findings that we had made, and, and that was quite useful. So what did we find? We found that actually it was true that patients, uh, pregnant mothers slept on the floor. There was a video that was actually given to us by Mr. Saul, but also almost all the, the people that we interviewed confirmed that that was the case. So we couldn't, we couldn't obviously ignore that. Then there was the confirmation that obviously the CEO did not spend as much time as he was supposed to uh, at the hospital. And I've given you the number of dates, it was 182. And uh, uh, what had happened was that she had provided that information to the previous MEC. So it was her information that actually documented uh, the days that she had not been in the hospital. But our team obviously did further investigations to go to the HR to look for how leave is uh, 
you know, is, is appropriated or given in the department. And we did find that, you know, uh, in 2021, there were a shortfall of 27 days that we couldn't account for from just doing our own calculations. And in 22, uh, 2022, it was 72 days of, uh, of, uh, of, of this that could not be accounted for. And all that is in the report. And clearly, the allegation that uh, you know the dignity of the patient was not being respected becomes really obvious. If you have a pregnant woman sleeping on the floor, you obviously take her dignity. If you have a, a pregnant ladies that are in a hospital that is unsafe, where the toilets are not functioning, the heating system cannot function because of the breakages of the system, that cannot be a dignified environment to find yourself in. So that was also confirmed, I think, uh, by our walkabout. And, and as I say, we've taken lots of pictures that you will find, I think, in the report when you do look at it, because the annexures are actually three times bigger than the report itself. Just for those people that are visually uh, excited, I think you'll find it uh, quite interesting to, to go through the document. We then f f had other additional findings. We find that there were several lapses uh, in the appointment of CEOs in Houting. What do I mean by that? Uh, I'll give an example. When you are a vice chancellor, there are certain positions you can fiddle around. And in the university, these are the, the professoriate. You want those in the description of those people that go to bed horses to be the thoroughbreds of your institution. You can't, uh, you can't fiddle around and think, oh, should he be a professor or should he not? It's either they are a professor or they are not. Uh, once you start to have doubts, and there's no benefit of doubt that you give to a professor. You do it the other way around. There should be no doubt at all. Now, the CEOs of hospitals are really the highest level in the hospital services that determine the direction around which the quality service is provided, but also they feed into the minister and the MECs. The MECs depend for their own interpretation of what's happening in the health service by the CEOs. So the criteria for selecting CEOs has to be absolutely, you know, unquestionable. And what we did find was that in Gauteng, unlike in other provinces, they have lowered the criteria for appointing CEOs. Now, you can say, yeah, all I can hear some people muttering. So how else can you read this? Think about it. We have nine provinces in our country. In only one province have CEOs been suspended. Which province is that? How then? Galafoum, two at uh, Tembisa, and, uh, and obviously, you know, several others. You go to KZN, you don't find that. You go to the Western Cape, you don't find that. You go to my home province, Limpopo, you don't find that. I, so there is something that you could pick up that in Gauteng, the supposedly well-resourced province, the top province, has a problem of, uh, of choosing CEOs. What was even worse was that when we looked at the choices of the CEOs, the, the selection committee and uh, the employer didn't seem to read what the referee's report have said, the competency test have said. They just seem to ignore that to choose somebody. Uh, you know, there is a language in South Africa that you can use that I'm not going to use here uh, so that I don't go to jail. So there is a problem of human resources, <laughs> the quality of the people that we choose to lead our hospital, and in Gauteng it seems to be worse than in other provinces. Uh, I've already spoken about the infrastructure uh, of the hospital. 
uh, as I say, a study had been done in 2016. I think we were just reconfirming that, that uh, the sewage system is not working, the heating system is not working, the toilets are not working, and uh, there are pictures to show that. Here is something that uh, really worried me. You have a specialized hospital, which Rahima Musa is. It's highly specialized. It looks after mothers and babies, and obviously it is a high-risk, highly specialized uh, hospital. It has no laboratory service. It has got no blood bank. And anybody who has been in an obstetric ward knows that, you know, blood is almost the life blood of obstetric practice. Operations are the life blood of obstetric. And neonates are, you know, those are the sort of things that you can't run such a hospital without a 24-hour laboratory service. Rahima Musa doesn't have that in the 21st century. If you said that to people, uh, maybe we should tell the Minister of Home Affairs to tell all these people who come to our country that we don't, we have such hospital, they may not come. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's a topic for another time. So they don't have that. Uh, CAT scan, they have got one CAT scan that doesn't seem to function, but uh, apparently it's been sorted out. They didn't have a hospital board, but uh, I think they are trying to sort that out. I think Normandy is doing that. And then they've got security challenges. Hospital staff has been marked in the campus. Cars have been stolen there. And the securities don't seem to have the equipment to perform jobs as security. You know, when I was uh, when I was a young doctor, uh, I worked in a hospital where the security were so obese that they could never catch you if you ran away. <laughs> so you know, you you employ these people to to become security, but you know that they can't do their job. But nevertheless, it's fine. So I think there is a challenge of security, and I think uh, it will be sorted out. There's a shortage of nursing staff, <coughs> and uh, the famous supply chain management is all over. And you know when there are problems of supply management, it's, it's, a, it's another word for corruption. But uh, we didn't go into that because it's not our thing. So we know that uh, Rahima Musa obviously has got a catchment area. And a study was done that over the past three years, it, it gets about 40% of his patients are not South African citizen, but that's a, a topic that obviously it excites South African. But 40% of the patients that go to Rahima Musa are not South African citizen, and because of the overcrowding, uh, the filthy environment, this is obviously a fertile ground for nosocomial infections. And for those of you who know, neonates are the most vulnerable to such infections because their immune system is not well developed and so forth. And to crown you all, there is no intensive care in a modern specialized hospital such as Rahima Musa. So what did we think it was worth recommending? The first recommendation, which I think uh, the province had already taken, I think, steps which for which we compliment them, was that uh, we felt that Re Rahima Musa deserved to have a new CEO. And that CEO must be fit for purpose. And I think I have had some discussions with both the Premier of the province and the MEC with regards to this, I think, and they understand that, uh, that clearly, and I think they, uh, they themselves are, are concerned. In the report, we have spelled out what we think are the minimum criteria to have a CEO run a hospital uh, of the nature and of the size of, uh, of Rahima Musa. So we are recommending that there be a new CEO appointed, the criteria be defined properly, and the selection processes and the reports of that must be unambiguous that this is for a CEO and not be fudged because I think it will be discovered again. 
The second uh, recommendation we made was that uh, the, the, the former CEO who, has, who the department has already taken away from the hospital should really uh, be removed from this environment where she is. And the province has already done that. They have taken her to, to the head office. That's where she works. And in interviewing her, it became clear in her own word repeatedly that this was the most stressful job she had ever done. And uh, she, she had obviously problem in handling stress, but uh, she seems to be coping well where she is at the moment uh, f from the few conversations I've had with her. But in addition to that, uh, this investigation went beyond the hospital. Uh, we then contacted the HPCSA and discovered that obviously she does have uh, engagements with the HPCSA, SPCSA and they were trying to, I think they were trying to stabilize her uh, for the condition that she has. And uh, in our conversation and discussion, I think uh, with the people in the province, I think it was agreed that uh, she should commit herself to this stabilization when she is at the head office so that she can, she can be supported uh, and be stabilized and then be assessed, I think, for what uh, future role she can play, but not to be, I think, in an environment that is as stressful as she was exposed to at Rahima Musa Hospital. And we have supported that. Uh, I will be in touch with the, with the Health Professional Council to find a way in which I think the, the previous uh, CEO can be supported. Uh, the next recommendation we made was that I think the hospital should be prioritized for infrastructure. I think uh, the Premier confirmed that with the MEC and uh, be dealt with, I think, properly. And they should uh, ensure that the hospital is gazetted as a tertiary hospital because that's the function it does, but I think the way it's classified, it's something is, is quite different. I've already spoken about really the leadership issues at the uh, Rahima Musa that they do need to appoint, I think, people in leadership that are competent at almost all levels. I mean, the HR system there uh, is it's not, uh, I think, comp you know, uh, consistent with the level at which the hospital is functioning. Uh, and also, I think we have recommended that they should go back to the the 2016 report and look at it when they are doing these uh, uh, recommendations and, and, and sort it out. They should look at their staff establishment, particularly their nursing establishment, and they, sh they should try and establish an ICU. Otherwise, otherwise we have <laughs> a hospital in the heart of South Africa that functions, I don't know, uh, like what. You know, uh, I come from a small town. Uh, we have a small hospital called Jane Fest, which has got most of these things that I'm talking about. Now I come to Joburg, and I think I'm being promoted. I'm going to be in Josie. Then I go to a hospital that has got no ICU, there's no laboratory. I mean, what have I done? You know, it's a demotion. For, but but we are still crazy about Joburg. Anyway. And then we have recommended uh, really two disciplinary inquiries. One must be, we felt that the, the current CEO should really be taken to account to deal with the way in which she dealt with her leave uh, arrangements. I mean, that's for the, for, the, for the disciplinary inquiry to decide how to handle that. But we felt that this is actually an administrative issue that should be dealt with that way. It cannot be dealt with, you know, we cannot find a political solution like uh, sometimes we do in South Africa. There's none here. You have to deal with it administratively. And then there is a, there's a lady called Kuduka who was in charge of the, of the theaters. The hospital ran short of um, uh, uh, the me medication that is used to prepare for abdominal surgery. And she decided to go and create her own concoction that was used, I think, uh, to to clean uh, people for 
abdominal surgery. And I think that led to about 11 infections that had to be taken back to theater. But again, that's something that uh, the, the hospital needs to deal with. So, you know, you're working in a hospital where everything gets tested yeah. and uh, the right criteria, and then you just go and make your own medicine and, and give it to people without them knowing that this is not the right thing. So we just felt that uh, that's, uh, yeah. And then at the end of this report, we have listed all the norms and standards that have been breached in this hospital. As I say, we have shared this re report with the Premier and the MEC, and we are sharing it with you today. But that's all that I have to say about uh, uh, this uh, investigation. And again, I'm grateful to the people who did this. It took us almost a year minus 23 days to finish this investigation. That's how long it took us. But uh, we think we have identified the issues and uh, the issues are quite specific, but they are also general in nature. And I think uh, the new team in Houting have got their job cut out into the future. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof, uh, for uh, the presentation of the report. Uh, colleagues, uh, I'm now going to call uh, to the podium the Honorable Minister of Health uh, to give us uh, the remarks uh, in relation to the presentation that was done by the Health Ombud. Over to you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, let me firstly uh, say good morning to Professor Mahoba, uh, our health ombud, and thank him for a uh, job well done. Uh, pass my regards to my colleague, uh, Deputy Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Lomo, the MEC, uh, the Chair of the Office of the Health Standard, and uh, the a board member who's also accompanying him, <coughs> and uh, the CEO uh, who also uh, started these proceedings and 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 everybody else who is here from both Houting and the National Health Department. Uh, again, we are very thankful to the job well done by the Health Ombud, as always, uh, telling it as it is. Um, um, <coughs> indeed, uh, that is what uh, the law which established the health ombuds office has actually said uh, in that the investigations of any complaint must be done in good faith uh, without fear without favor without bias and without any prejudice the purpose of this being <coughs> to pro protect and promote the health and safety of users of the of our health services um, now this applies to health service. I, I know that overall, as uh, Prof. Mahova has indicated, uh, a few other reports which he has done, it's mainly been in the public service. But in terms of the, the law, uh, let me just remind citizens that even complaints regarding private health services should also be submitted to the Office of the Health Ombud. Uh, I think that's something which uh, we need to just check over the last five years or, or, or more whether uh, that has been happening. We know that 85% um, or more of South Africans depend on the public health system. Uh, that's the system which carries the burden under a lot of pressure. And that's why most of the complaints will come from the public health uh, system. But uh, just to remind South Africans that they must not be shy of reporting also uh, deficiencies which they come across also in the private health services. Indeed, it's a very sobering report, a very sobering report. 
uh, which lays by uh, a lot of shortcomings within uh, our health system, as I agree with uh, uh, Prof. Mahova that um, while this is about uh, Rahiba Musa uh, Mother and Child Hospital, uh, we're quite aware that a number of other facilities uh, in our public health system suffers equal deficiencies. Uh, so uh, that's what we need to be looking at. Uh, but very specifically for this morning, uh, talking about the Rah Rahima Musa Mother and Child Hospital, uh, as he has uh, indicated, a very iconic hospital with a lot of history uh, in, it, in its own right in terms of the role it has played over many years. But also, Prof. and MBC and the Deputy Minister and colleagues, uh, I think we also owe it to uh, the very good gesture which uh, Houghton government did many years ago, naming some of these hospitals after our heroes and heroines. Uh, Comrade Rahima Musa was one of the leaders uh, of the Women's March of 9th August 1956 across here. Uh, where I was earlier this morning at uh, the Union Building. Uh, so those are the, our heroines. It's equally so, whether we talk about Helen Joseph, uh, Charlotte McLeague, very good gesture. Uh, equally, as we said the other time when you're talking, let me say, about the Tambo Memorial, that, uh, we, you know, we also must recognize the burden of responsibility when we do these good gestures of recognizing our heroes. We can't put their names and then not look after those institutions and make sure that they live up to, you know, what those leaders, uh, their standards of service to the people uh, demand of us. So so that's the responsibility which uh, uh, MC, the Houting and ourselves have to take from the report of the, of the health ombuds. Um, we appreciate uh, all the matters which the report is pointing out about the plight of uh, very vulnerable, you know, mothers, pregnant women who come to the hospital and give birth. And uh, before they can go through, you know, th this very important process of uh, uh, producing new life, they have to go through harrowing experiences of sitting on chairs and also sleeping on the floor. Um, and, and that says a lot about the pressure on, on the institution. Um, we know that uh, that pressure, as, as the report also indicates, uh, is both in terms of just the growth of the population uh, and with no uh, simultaneous growth in our capacity to look after uh, the people, but uh, also internal migration, I mean, how to, uh, I think over a 10 year period as the population, just in terms of those resident in Gauteng, has increased from uh, in, in 10 years period from around 9 million to currently about 16 million people. So, uh, so that's a very significant growth. But as the report indicates, over and above that, you also have uh, also uh, non-South Africans who also come specifically for maternity services. Uh, we know that uh, in this province, uh, across while there are demands for other services across the board uh, for South Africans and also uh, non-South Africans, uh, some some of them not even documented. Um, uh, but um, we we know that uh, that 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 pressure is is huge, and and uh, some of those simply come for the maternity services, it's the most pressurized service uh, across all the, all the hospitals in Gauteng. <laughs> but, um, but over and above the, the capacity, it's also, as the report indicates, just uh, lack of maintenance uh, of, of various key facilities, as already uh, uh, mentioned, very basic, some of those very basic. I mean, if your ablution facilities are, just, are not maintained, uh, the risk is huge. Uh, the risk is huge. So, um, for us, what we want to commit uh, uh, to to the team, uh, the, the, the Professor Makoba and his team, 
uh, for the very you know uh, uh, you know uh, good work which has been done we want to commit to work together with the province to expedite the remedial action which is required um, uh, one in terms of the infrastructure which must be attended to um, but also in terms of the um, the man management capacity which which is quite key uh, because uh, the, the report highlights deficiencies uh, in in management because um, we also are aware of uh, MEC of the fact that uh, some of these area areas it's not purely uh, the issue of money uh, it's also just uh, management deficiencies um, I mean, not long ago, I, I went to one of the other hospitals where uh, I asked one of our senior managers to, to go and just help. And then when she came back, and there was also these issues of, you know, uh, just not uh, lack of cleaning, uh, basic maintenance and, and cleaning. And then when she came back, she said, you know, Minister, I found, I met a number of, I think there were about 15 uh, artisans who were actually idling in the hospital. Some of them said they were plumbers, some said they were electricians. And I asked, but you can't, the, the, so many toilets are blocked uh, and you've got plumbers, electricians. And then they said, uh, uh, one was that, although they are based in the hospital, they report to another department. Uh, and so they are waiting for instructions. I mean, imagine, a plumber who's paid a salary and is there from 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, hopefully staying until 4, even though you don't know what they're doing. But he's waiting for instructions to go and unblock a toilet because uh, somebody has not said, go and unblock this toilet. And these are people on, on, on salaries. And it was only after, she said, you know, after a bit of pep talk and, and encouragement, uh, uh, some work was done. So. The issue which the report highlights of the CO is just a, the CO is just a representation of the, the the lapses of management which we must deal with. Uh, but of course, if you don't have a leader in the form of a CO, then uh, very little is going to to go right. And I'm happy that uh, that matter, uh, you know, there's a beginning of of dealing with that. So um, as I conclude, uh, I want to pledge to um, to the ombud and, and his team and to the uh, residents of, of Houting and others utilizing this particular facility and as we say it is a microcosm of other challenges with other facilities we are determined uh, working together we do have uh, programs through which we you know uh, look at all these facilities uh, to try and make sure that uh, there can be improvement. We have said to ourselves that, uh, of course, over, over just over two years, we are derailed by uh, the pandemic where there was too much focus in terms of uh, financial resources, infrastructure, human resources, just focusing on the pandemic. And we shouldn't make excuse about that, that, that but that was also a diversion. Uh, we, had, we are happy that that part is now settled in the sense that the stability, we're not getting any uh, serious challenges in that regard. So I've said to a uh, team uh, of within the National Department when we have our meetings so that, uh, 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 you know, together with uh, Dr. Lomo, that uh, colleagues, there is no more excuse about COVID. COVID, uh, while we say it's still in our midst, we still need to vaccinate and protect ourselves. We can't use it as an excuse why this and that has not been done. So, uh, and as I conclude, uh, maybe just a digression to say uh, this morning, I'm also happy, Prof, and, and all the people here that I believe, I think over the last seven days uh, with the, all the MECs, we could also use the strike as an excuse. <laughs> but uh, thanks to the assistance of uh, the judiciary in, in helping us to execute our responsibilities as of you know this week uh, going forward um, I'm informed that uh, things are returning to normality so uh, from tomorrow onwards uh, MEC uh, and, and Deputy Minister and all our managers 
in all provinces, it's over now to use the strike as an excuse <laughs> for not performing in the same way as we can no more use COVID. So as we address the problems of uh, Rahima Musa, mother and child, let us also commit totally uh, to making sure that with them, uh, the resources at our disposal, as inadequate as they may be, we must do our best in making sure that we can uh, improve, continuously improve the quality of services, especially in the public service. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister, for those I mean, uh, remarks. Uh, colleagues, uh, I'm now going to hand over the report to the Ombud, who will in turn uh, also hand over to the CEO. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm supposed to hand over a hard copy of this to the Minister. Uh, I'm sure all of you you will get copies uh, as a as a present for blessing us today. But the minister has to get the first one. Okay. As you can see, the annexes are bigger than the report. And the chairperson of the board and the MEC and the deputy MEC. Colleagues, uh, we are now uh, going to allow uh, members of the media an opportunity to uh, pose some I mean, questions. Uh, those who are present here, and also those that are on the uh, visual I mean, uh, platforms, uh, to also ask questions if they have. Uh, colleagues, uh, the floor is officially opened. For questions, I've noted uh, you. I've not uh, in that sequence. Uh, one, two, three. Yeah, let's take those first and four. Yeah, four. That's it. Yeah, you first. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is um, Paul Polka from the Soweto. I just have two questions for the health minister and the housing health MEC. So firstly, um, will you be playing any supervisory role to ensure that the hospital uh, implements uh, the recommendations? Uh, 
and uh, secondly um, until when does uh, Rahima Musa mother and child hospital have to appoint a new CEO so what timeline will be um, implemented to appoint the CEO Hello, uh, Slinda Lamasigani from ENCA. Um, I'd like to start with the issue of accountability. I don't see anything in the report with regards to who's going to be held accountable uh, for the lack of implementation from the first report in 2017 to now, and whether there's anybody who can be criminally liable for the issues at the hospital, because the report also mentions issues around a lack of infrastructure maintenance and development at the hospital and I'm pretty sure this hospital has a budget that it's allocated to get upgrades for example. Um, secondly in terms of the timelines on the turnaround for the hospital do we have any set timelines on those? I know for the CEO in particular it's three months but when it comes to infrastructure um, and other hygiene and security issues well, what are the time frames there? And I'm hoping there'll be a second round because I have more questions around halting hospitals in general. Or okay, can I ask them now? Right. We'll give you a chance. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah. Thanks. The third one. Lilita Tuabe from Health E News Service. I just wanted to ask Professor Makhoba to please give us more details about what he means when he talks about the supply chain problems that indicate corruption. And I also wanted to just check in whether the pictures that he referred to would be available for the media. Thank you. Thank you. The last round. Uh. Thanks. It's Kovoto Modise from Eyewitness News. Um, I wanted to find out, just clarity please on the days that were unaccounted for for um, the CEO. I heard, I think it was 27 and then I heard 71. Is 71 the, um, the full number of days that were unaccounted for? And then I know that um, the Ombud said you had a, a, some sort of an engagement with her. Where did she say she was for these 71 days um, that she clearly didn't report to work for? And then you speak about stabilizing her, uh, Ombud. Um, uh, can you just clarify what that means? So you say you're going to be stabilizing her, providing her some sort of support. What does the stabilization for her mean? Um, and then during this time that she's at the health department, will she continue to get a salary during this time? And then just um, in terms of the timelines, what are the timelines for her DC um, particularly? When will she come to this DC and, yeah, your Kupati timelines? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for those. Uh, yeah, you can go. Yes. Thank you. It's Mulema Muta from SABC TV News. Uh, still on the CEO, my question is uh, whether she did at any point a reported the strenuous conditions uh, under which she was working and to who and as to also um, who was holding the fort in her absence. Okay, now thank you. Uh, I'm now going to allow um, uh, the panel here to respond to the questions. Uh, Prof, I'll hand over to you first so that you can address those and then will be followed by... Uh, first of all, uh, I did say that uh, there were 27 days that were calculated in 2021 and there were 71 days that were calculated in 2022. So they are not at the same span uh, that the calculations was made. And these calculations were made through records in the HR department and, uh, and other pieces of information. But more importantly is that uh, obviously we needed explanation. Let me give you an example. If somebody says, I didn't come to work because I was on a Zoom meeting. Now when you go on to a Zoom meeting, it's recorded that you are on a Zoom. You log in and it will pick you up. Uh, or if you are not able to explain as to where you were, I think that cannot be justifiable as the day on which you worked. Uh, and sometimes 
you 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 say you are at work and then people see you in a function so these are things that become inconsistent and i think that's how we came to the conclusion that some of the days were the way they were and as i say she has been provided with this information so she has seen it it's not like a, it's a secret or anything like that but importantly i think the first uh, dates that were recorded uh, that were presented to the legislature that information was from her that those were the days and uh, and obviously we could only accept that if the person says that i wasn't there for those days and uh, and so forth so i think that is that is the first thing the second one is i think in in all these recommendations we have tried to put the time frames uh, in 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 most of them if not all uh, remember that uh, the role of the ombud is not to be punitive uh, because we don't have that power what we are supposed to do is to make findings and recommendations that is our role now we have made recommendations that somebody must be disciplined the province may decide we don't want to discipline this and we're not going to be chasing them all over town why they didn't discipline a person they must have a rationale for that so i think uh, just understand where the limits of our, our powers are uh, you know uh, you can't be a referee player a goalkeeper and uh, and a scorer so our powers have been you know delineated in a particular way our role is to make findings recommendations against the norms and standards that have been prescribed by the minister that's why i've listed the norms and standards that have been breached in this uh, investigations as as a two pages of them in your in your in your report those that wanted to see the slides actually the annexures contain all the slides that you want to see uh, in relation to the infrastructure that you want to see that happened at the hospital the the issue of uh, of uh, the ceo what do i mean when i say uh, she requires support first of all uh, the the ceo uh, has a condition uh, that she you know she obviously did release to us as to what the conditions was uh, and when we were uh, inquiring and investigating in relation to the hpcsa we also confirmed that she had actually also notified the hpcsa and they had decided that she requires some specialized treatment that she needs to undergo and all i needed to confirm from her was whether she's committed to that because if she was not committed to that then there are consequences for that if you're not committed and the hpcsa wants to help you in your professional sense so all of these things we have gone through and the the ultimate aim as uh, somebody said uh, my role as an ombud is to investigate and find solutions in an amicable way and not i'm not in the business of destroying people's careers i'm in the business of ensuring that people are accountable they are supported where it is necessary to be supported and uh, i felt that that support was required both from the province remember the province has a contract with her they have decided she can't be the ceo but they want to see her at the headquarters now what must she do when she's there for the next 3 years of her contract she must be supported and be allowed to undergo training in whatever way that the the province deems fit and the hpcsa at the same time will be assessing her status of stress management or whatever it is so that uh, she can become a complete human being at the end of it all now what happens at the end of her contract is something that obviously both the hpcsa and the the employer must come to decide and obviously they will talk to her 
that uh, we are going to assess you, and this is how we feel things should be. But uh, I'm not I'm not given the power to terminate people's contracts. Are there any questions that I didn't answer? Slindel, I think you had some questions that uh, maybe I missed. Uh, there was a question around accountability. The hospital hasn't been upgraded basically since it was built. Well, uh, that is not a, a, a domain of my speciality in life. But in general, if you were to, to take a drive to many hospitals in our country, I'm sure you would find many people that are criminally liable because most of them have never seen a paint since when they were built. So I don't think that the idea here was to, to find criminality. It was to identify what the problems are and how they can be corrected. You did ask about the issue of accountability. Obviously, the accountable authority uh, at the moment will be the MEC and maybe the Premier and their team in Gauteng to say, we have this problem that we're seeing in our province, how do we solve it? I think in some way they've indicated that they've prioritized the hospital, they want it to be done. And, and remember that there are many other people who have worked in this position before the current CEO. She's only been there for two years, and we're talking about something that has been there for, for a long time. So I don't know how you can, um, even with the best legal brains, I don't think uh, you, know, you can find criminal liability in such a situation. The hospital is just dilapidated and it needs to be fixed. And I'm not sure how you identify those that may be criminally liable. Uh, you know, I in South Africa, unfortunately, when people can't account for themselves, the only person who gets uh, blamed for everything is the minister. So I think <laughs> we must be also be careful. I is he criminally liable? I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, yeah, but the MEC, the Premier, and obviously the the CEO of uh, OHSC are the people that are supposed to take this matter forward. My function, I, I behave like a bee. I only sting and I die afterwards. <laughs> That's what I've done. There's another question here. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> colleagues, um, we're going to afford um, in the MEC to also respond to some of the questions. I think maybe yours is also will be covered by the MEC. Yeah, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me greet the minister, the deputy minister, the chair of the board, the chair of the ombudsman, and all the people that are here that have been acknowledged earlier on when we arrived. Um, I think, uh, Chair, I'm not going to... The Minister is going to come and summarize some of the issues that we are raising. But one, what I wanted to indicate is that the recommendations that um, uh, that the Makoba is raising, some of them already were implementing them. When I started four months ago, I visited all the hospitals. I picked up these issues that are raised in the report, including at Rai Mamusa. In fact, I know all of them now, even if I'm sleeping, I can count what is it, what's happening in the hospital. Then we came up in the office, we made a plan of how can we deal with those problems, being it financial problems, issues that are related to the clinical services, and, and the ones that the infrastructure one, which were the major one. And we, were, we agreed that instead of pointing fingers at each other and say it's not me, it's DID, let's just have our own plan in the department in terms of making sure that we service the hospitals, clinics that are there in terms of our infrastructure that has been old, some of it. So we do have that plan and we're working on it now. That's why Raima Musa is part of those hospitals that we're prioritizing out of the 10 that we said to Minister, we need assistance. And Minister is helping us again two weeks back. He had a report that he wanted from us in the province and he highlighted again the need of pumping more resources when it comes to infrastructure. That will be managed again properly because there's something else of bringing resources and then you don't manage those resources. Hence, we'll be working jointly with the national office when it comes to that one off. Because what was happening in the hospitals, 
were not even maintaining some of the minor maintenance problems. They were not done by us, they were done by DID. You see a bulb uh, hanging, then a person pass and say, it's not me, it's DID. Then the DID will go and do the quotations that will take three to four months. Then that process again, it drags. That's when we said, now, I am not going to do that. You are going to make sure that we do our own minor infrastructure in all the hospitals. And that's the decision we've taken. And I think so far now it's yielding results. I'm sure last week we've seen the work that we've done towards, that we've done on our own as the provincial government, at, uh, in fact, Department of Health at Tembisa Hospital for that overflow that everybody has been talking about, which we know because we went there, clean it and make sure that now at least let's do the overflow so that people who don't find them sitting on the chairs because uh, they don't have space. It's still not enough, but we're working on that. So we've identified all of them and we are going to implement the minister and chair. And the other one is the one that talks to the financial account accountability. We have tightened some controls in the department. I know some of you have some tenders in the department. I'm no longer famous with you because there is a certain period, Minister, that we have said we are watching the trend in the department that was happening that people, uh, Chair, will submit their invoices. For, uh, now it's May, April is coming. Already the financial year ended in our department in October. That's what's happening when it comes to the coffers. We don't have money because it has been finished. Then they will do some work and then claim for that work, wait for April and then submit their invoices. Then they pay them. So when it comes to October, November, already there's no money in the department. So we've cut that, we've tightened it and said everything which is a cruel or irregular expenditure. These are the lines and they are accounting to us. CEOs and finance managers are accounting to us on monthly basis now, which is something that was not done before. It has been difficult on the first month because everyone was jumping that who is this MEC that says now we must come with CEOs and account because some of the CEOs are not even knowing the budget of the hospitals, the expenditure that is being done there. Let alone minister that there is another way because we're working with the department of finance in terms of property auditors and on the bigger tenders then they will delay in buying machines that are expected because now there is this other person that must do the work for us when we do the requisitions so all those things the management we have changed everything we're doing now things in-house we're putting up controls but we're bringing in the national so that each and everything we accounted national so that they must know what is it that we're not doing correctly as a province which we have not been doing then the new ceo we have been a plan of having a new ceo at raima musa but even the person that is acting now with the two months that he has been there there is improvement in the hospital some of the things that appeared in the report they are addressing them including the one of the blood bank we are addressing it so that it is corrected um, we are stabilizing it, Minister. I will leave it to Minister to come and speak to some of the issues, but we want everyone to assist us to take interest of hospitals where you live, including the clinics, especially in this province. Make sure that you assist us, you become our eyes and ears on the ground to ensure that all of us, we change the, the status of public sector in our province, especially the health department. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, MSC. Uh, uh, indeed, the question as to whether, as a national uh, ministry and the department, we will be playing a supervisory role. The answer is yes, as the MSC has indicated. We have that constitutional responsibility uh, to uh, account and also um, guide and, and supervise the provision of services, uh, coordination, and, and work with the colleagues in the provinces. Uh, we've been working quite closely uh, with all the provinces, but uh, because Gauteng is special, as uh, Prof. Has said, is special uh, in many ways. Uh, not only is one quarter of the South Africans uh, here in Gauteng currently, out of the 60 million or so, as we said, 16 million South Africans are here in this small geographic province. Um, <coughs> in terms of the economy of the country, it's the most important with uh, most of the economy. 30, uh, uh, professor here said 33% of the GDP 
is here in Gauteng. From our side as health, uh, it's absolutely very important because uh, uh, in the provision of specialized services, this is the only province which hosts uh, four of what we call central hospitals. Uh, out of, I mean, out of ten, ten central hospitals, four are in this one province. Uh, these are also teaching hospitals as well. They are attached to medical schools. Two of them attached to Vets Medical School. That's uh, Chris Barra and Charlotte McLeke. And then uh, you have uh, across the road here, Steve Pico, uh, which is the teaching hospital for University of Pretoria Medical School. George Mukari, further north. Uh, as a teaching hospital for uh, the Sfako Mahatu uh, Health Sciences University. So, and, and providing specialized services in those central hospitals, not only for the residents of Gauteng, the rest of the country, uh, about directly, I would say, uh, our province, myself and the prof here from Limpopo, we depend a lot on uh, the services of this four hospitals here, especially George Mukari and Steve Pico. Pumalanga depends on that. Northwest depends on that. Uh, Free State has got the central hospital, but they have limited uh, capacity. Sometimes they also bring patients here, even Northern Cape. So uh, the rest of the country depends a lot on this province. So we have said to uh, the team, the Premier and the MEC that we, we, we will be working with you, we will be watching you, uh, and because if Gauteng doesn't work, and when you have all these challenges, it just destabilizes the rest of the country. So it's, it's for that reason that uh, we have a very specific interest in making sure that uh, uh, Gauteng works. So uh, again, um, we'll be following up the details in terms of specifically uh, the Rahima Musa uh, recommendations, uh, but also uh, both in the, in the infrastructure with our team, you know, in all the hospitals. If you talk to our infrastructure head, uh, he also knows in and out of how the hospitals. If, if you wake him up at night, he'll tell you uh, this is the pro challenge in this one, in this one, uh, so many. I can't remember the number, I think it's 30 something. Yeah. So he will tell you each one what is the challenge. And because we also, uh, both technically and financially, we have to work with with the provinces because uh, with with the the challenges of, of financing uh, we have a cushion in the sense that treasury does allocate to us for instance on infrastructure and also in terms of uh, some of the equipment specialized equipment we have a number of grants uh, because the difficulty sometimes when the provinces are under pressure um, the chair of uh, OHSC being a former CEO of Steve Bigo will tell you Part of the problem which happens, uh, which the, uh, the provinces face, is that uh, the very pressure which we are under now to pay 10% increase. Let's, uh, let's suppose public service and bargaining council uh, agrees on the 10%. What is going to happen? Uh, the decision will be provinces, we have agreed to a 10%, find it in your budget. And then what happens to the hospitals? They get instructed, your staff has now got 10%, but your allocation remains like last year. So what happens? A lot of the money then goes to the salaries. Uh, and then it crowds out maintenance, crowds out equipment. So one of the things which at least we provide a cushion I with some of these grants, infrastructure, tertiary services grants, and so on, both a little bit, I mean, on infrastructure, on equipment, and also sometimes also supplementing even on specialized human resources. So for those reasons, uh, uh, we, we're really talking very practical things when we say that uh, even with the Rahima Musa as a, a, a major provider of specialized services and also training, because there are a lot of uh, undergraduate training and also postgraduate training, which is also happening there. So we have a lot of interest in... Uh, uh, making sure that the recommendations uh, which have been made by the ombud are definitely implemented. Thank you.
Uh, colleagues, uh, I'm now going to take uh, the questions from the visual platform. Uh, Tagalan, if you can uh, uh, read those um, questions for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. We only have uh, one question from uh, Tamar Khan from Business Day. And the question is directed to Prof. Maho. And the question is given that uh, your investigation found the hospital was unsafe and unclean. Did you find any direct evidence uh, that the conditions in the hospital caused harm to a specific uh, pregnant women and or their babies? And if so, uh, please elaborate. Thanks. Uh, let me take um, uh, uh, last round from the floor. Then we'll, I'll afford them in the panel to, to respond. It's the last one, I promise. Your first... Second, it's only those two, yeah. Three, yeah, then we're done, yeah. Um, Celine Dolo Masigani once more for ENCA. Um, yes, I just wanted to clarify the issue around the strike, um, the strike action that's been um, in Ghana for the past couple of months. Um, I want to know um, how long the military service will be deployed. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, how long will the military service be deployed? Um, is the death death toll still sitting at four? Um, and just an overall assessment of the Gauteng hospitals in general. Um, I mean, I think it's quite shocking that the ombudsman says that in a province that's so well resourced, it's the only one that seems to have an issue when it comes to um, management of the hospitals, in particular CEOs. So I, I would just like to get your reaction in terms of um, what kind of movement you want to see or changes being done um, to improve the state of the hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. C colleagues, uh, maybe before you can pose your question, let, let us be brief uh, on our questions. Uh, please, colleagues. You are second, the last, and then we're done with the questions. Lilita Gwabe, Health E News Service. This is a first round question where I was asking the ombudsman about clarity around the supply chain management um, problems that you said indicate corruption. Thank you. Thank you. You can come in. The last one. It's um, Paul Koka again from the Sovetan uh, newspaper. Uh, I think maybe this question has been answered, but I'll just uh, ask it again just to be sure. So it's to Prof. Uh, Mahova. Uh, who needs to do what uh, with uh, this report? Like, uh, who's going to monitor that the recommendations are implemented? Are you going to do it yourself? So I just want to understand that. And then for the health MEC, um, now that the report is out, uh, what is the next step that must be followed? So as we leave here, so what's going to happen now that the report is out? And finally, um, how many negligence lawsuits does the Houting Health Department have with regards to Rahima Musa? And uh, from those lawsuits, like what is the, um, um, the total cost related to those lawsuits? Thank you. Okay, now thank you. Yeah, the prof will, will be first and then followed by MEC and the minister. Thank you. Can, can, can this person who asked before you just repeat her question? I think somebody asked something that it was the first question that she wanted to me to answer. About the supply chain management. Okay, yeah. Basically, uh, what I'm sorry I didn't answer it in the first uh, round. What we, the information and the evidence we gathered was that uh, people at Rahima uh, Musa Hospital would place orders. And these orders would be sent to the, to the CEO to sign. And there would be some delay or the CEO would find that there are things that have not been properly com completed and there are sort of... Uh, not proper assessment of of the applications and she would send them back and then they would go back and then they will wait for the ceo to be on leave or to be away from the hospital and then go to somebody who doesn't know the proper procedures and say this is urgent you know we've been at this thing for a long time and get her get whoever is in place to sign and and lots of mistakes are made in that process because you are not part of it. It's just one element 
one element of that. Now, this gentleman who asked, uh, do you remember Muhammad Ali? <laughs> he once said, you fly like a butterfly and sting like a bee. I told you my role is just to sting and let the butterflies look after everything. I don't, I don't look after and monitor my work. According to the law, the report goes to uh, Dr. Mdaweni and she has to monitor the implementation of the recommendations that are made and she will do that jointly, I think, with the MEC and the Department of Health. That's how it's done. Thank you. Mine it's what must be done is the implementation of the report. So I'll have to come up with a plan working with HPSC now because they are involved and I reported to the minister after that. And I will give ourselves, well, they are going, we are going to sit down, indicate what are the time frames, but already some of the work is being done. It's just to make sure that we finalize what we have started uh, in terms of implementation, submit it then to the relevant stakeholders that are here that, that are going to make sure that those recommendations, we do implement them. On the stats at Raima Musa, I think we don't, we can't answer that question now because we'll have to go back and check what is it because we have a, a number of hospitals, remember, so we don't just have stats um, of each and every hospital and we want to give you the relevant answer. I can give you Mutala Tala's number so that you can communicate. In fact, Acting HOT is here. You can send that letter that's Acting HOT at the back. And Mutala Tala is here. He has seen you. So he will give you the stats. I will definitely make sure that you get the stats today because I think you need them today. Thank you. Those were the two. Um, well, I can see uh, Slindal is taking advantage of my slip of the tongue <laughs> for mentioning about the strike in passing. <laughs> and she's making it a major issue. Well, um, <clears throat> the South African Military Health Services, as uh, I've said on a number of occasions, they really uh, came at our request to assist very specifically with uh, uh, health care and even the specifically nursing care because we were uh, a number of hospitals were struggling and we were very deliberate only when the uh, uh, situation is, is really quite uh, precarious as it was the case initially at the uh, Tsepon Stop and then uh, later on uh, we asked them once that was stabilized uh, to come over to Houting help us at the Tele Mukharane, Sebukeng, and any other. At some stage, we're also looking at Begim Langeni, but uh, during the course of time, as we're monitoring, it was uh, indicated that there's improvement. So uh, the military health services <coughs> um, are only there really at our request. Uh, I'm quite certain that, um, I mean, the report which I got uh, before coming here, before the starting even in my first meeting earlier, was a, a very encouraging uh, report in terms of the return to work. So once we are assured that things are stable uh, as early as end of today, uh, possibly at the very latest by tomorrow morning, all that it takes is for me to give a call to my colleague, uh, Minister of Defense, thank, uh, to thank the Surgeon General and his team, and then they will withdraw from, from, from where they've been helping us. So uh, I'm, I, I'm quite certain that, you know, uh, by f uh, late this afternoon, we'll have a clear picture and uh, we'll start communicating with the possibility that uh, the team, uh, I think now they'll just help to clean up things, hand over where they've already been taking care of patients, hand over to the rightful people, and then they'll leave. I expect that uh, possibly by late tomorrow. Uh, where they are still, they will be, they will be on their trucks, you know, going back to military hospitals and also to their barracks. 
Um, in terms of uh, patients who have succumbed during this period, we mentioned the four as from the initial report. We got further reports that uh, there are possibly more. But we are monitoring daily. Now that the strike, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, uh, that it's, it's over. Um, we, we will be from the HOD and the HODs of provinces, follow, they'll be following up with the clinicians, reconciling the numbers um, because, uh, you know, um, you, you hear there's, there's a hunger in, in the country for accountability. Uh, people are hungry for saying, you know, uh, there's just too much lawlessness, lawlessness in our country and part of what we have allowed even in our health sector it's, it's a sense of lawlessness where people can do anything and and just pass the blame so how do we you know uh, how do we make sure that even at the local individual level where there can be you know uh, a linkage between people who lost their lives and and the fact that staff were forcefully in some cases pulled out of their workplaces, that those who did that, when something and then happens subsequently, those who have done that must take accountability. So those are the things which is a really, I think, uh, for ourselves, uh, together with the Deputy Minister and the MECs, there's a lot of uh, expectation by many South Africans on our shoulders to say, can this stop? that uh, there must be some uh, accountability so so what we're doing that we're telling we're getting information clinical information and as as you know as that gets reconciled we'll be able to give uh, feedback to to south africans the question of uh, uh, the point which uh, 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 prof Mahova mentioned about uh, weakness of ceo selection in routing and you ask why what is the problem in terms of the uh, capacity here in Gauteng. Well, it, in summary, I would say uh, it's a reflection of some uh, objective weaknesses. Uh, there are subjective factors like uh, migration, which keep, gives pressure on the province, budget constraints, and so on. But there's also objective problems, objective weaknesses, which we have discussed frankly with the province. I mean, uh, this is the only province where in this term of the sixth administration, MEC Komarale uh, Hoko uh, is the fourth MEC in four years. Uh, you will find that only in Gauteng. Um, she is the fourth in four years. And uh, the acting HOD, um, you know, uh, sometimes when this thing happens, they say, oh, Gauteng is like uh, the Oscars. Which uh, what Prof was talking about uh, is very close to Hollywood, where you go to HOD acting, CFO acting, uh, manager of clinical services acting, and and when you trace it backwards as well, I think when we counted the other time, over the last uh, let me say uh, uh, from democracy, I think Houting also has the highest number. I mean, if you have four including those who are acting in the last four years. If you go further, you find that uh, Gauteng, I think, had about 12 MECs when other provinces are still on their third or fourth MEC. If you go to HODs, there are also about 12, 13 uh, head of department when others are at maybe number four, number five. Uh, in many provinces, even uh, uh, some MECs have done two terms in the health you know, um, I mean, one of the clearing examples which I can just say, uh, it's not necessarily the only explanation. Uh, there were no strikes in Limpopo for the last whole week. Uh, the MEC there has been in office. Uh, she's now possibly finishing a second term. She's almost uh, at least 10 years now. She'll be 10 years in office. Now, there's, there's no, you can't say there's no correlation. Uh, in terms of stability, of, of, of understanding the sector and, and, and being able to manage things and anticipate. She's been in it. I mean, even when we had our meeting, she was, she, I've seen this. They've already done the no work, no pay immediately when there were previous disturbances. They have the experience. They know how, what doesn't work. 
if you, uh, for instance, you are saying, if you delegate it to hospital managers, they are going to be intimidated. So you take it centrally. You get the reports, centralized, deduct. And that's how, I'm just giving you secrets of uh, our own meetings. <laughs> but it's just an example to say, so these things, uh, what, you, what the prof is pointing out here, if there is total instability right at the top, from political leadership, administrative leadership it goes right down to facilities so that's that's that, that's the answer so we need to work on that and make sure that uh, the stability and you know so that uh, uh, people know this can be done this can be done these are the criteria and then you don't have a situation where tomorrow because uh, you know you know officials uh, government officials uh, you know they know how to play uh, as uh, the political they tell you uh, you found that here so you can come with your instructions and so on now it's it's uh, it, it, they, they talk about that because you're going to have elections but mm. if you have a situation where they know every six months there's a new boss uh, then you're not going to get anything happening so even in terms of appointments you will find situations where people who are not qualified you know uh, end up being appointed uh, thank you very much I, I think I forgot to answer Tamara Khan's question about uh, about the uh, dirty and safe hospital. I did mention that uh, staff members, doctors, and others have been marked in that hospital because of basically the way uh, the security system is there. But just the, the environment around it is such that when you get the you get you get frightened a little bit and uh, you 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 get onto your wits but in terms of the hospital itself uh, can you imagine uh, young women uh, or even just pregnant women coming out of theater or having delivered and having to sit with stitches on a chair and the amount of pain they go through that and then they've got to sleep on the floor in those kind of pain some have had cesarean sections and so forth and i've indicated that i think uh, with the usage of that concoction that i mentioned there were 12 documented you know post operative infections that took place there uh, nosocomial infections obviously survive and thrive in a very filthy environment so i think one has to take those as a uh, part of the evidence to show that there was harm to patients in that environment that is actually quite dirty and filthy. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, the, our panel and our principals, for answering to those questions. Colleagues, on that note, uh, we have uh, now come to an end of our media briefings. We have a copy of the report, uh, which is here, uh, including the annex chair, and also the report is also available on the website. And those that uh, were streaming on, on the visual platform. Thank you so much. I've taken we've taken pictures already if you didn't you have missed it